Um, so my title is uh, New Attractors for the Black Hole Index. Um, this is some upcoming work with uh, Jan Boruch, um, Luca Eliesiu, and Joaquin Turiachi, where we revisit the classic attractor mechanism for supersymmetric black holes um, in um, supergravity in, in flat space, in asymptotically flat space. Okay. Um, and the main uh, story is the following, that the attractor mechanism is inconsistent, it's incompatible with the Euclidean functional integral that defines the supersymmetric index in the theory. Um, I'll explain all this as we go along. Um, and what we find is a class of saddle point solutions for the supersymmetric index. Um, and surprisingly, we find that these saddle points uh, have a new type of attractor mechanism associated with them. Okay, so that's going to be the main story. Help me by, by interrupting either for context or, or expert questions, anything. So let me begin. Um, so I'll begin at the very beginning. The, the main physics question we're interested in is to explain the thermodynamic entropy of black holes um, in terms of, um, as a statistical entropy. Okay, so every black hole in general relativity uh, has a thermodynamic entropy associated with it, which is equal to the area of the event horizon uh, divided by four in Planck units. This is the universal bacon hawking entropy formula. And the question is, can we, oops, can we um, associate a Boltzmann equation with this formula, right? So, um, which says that there's a logarithm of the, there's a number of microscopic states, d micro whose logarithm equals this thermodynamic entropy, okay? And today uh, I'm not uh, I'm not worried about quantum corrections to this formula or, or, or anything of the sort, okay? So I just want this kind of a semi-classical, sorry, thermodynamic, yeah, I want to ask if the Boltzmann equation is true in the thermodynamic limit. Now, one of the big successes of string theory is to exactly explain this kind of a statistical origin of black hole entropy. And the way it works is as follows. There are um, two pictures of black holes in string theory. The, one of them is the usual picture. There's a low energy limit of string theory, which is weakly coupled general relativity. Um, and uh, interacting with matter fields, and you have black hole solutions of this of this low energy theory. Um, and the the fact is that uh, typically supersymmetric black hole solutions have parameters. There are moduli which you can tune, and there's always one, um, at least one, which I can call G string, which when it's large compared to one over the size of the black hole, um, you have the usual description, and when it's small, you have the other weakly coupled description. Um, in terms of uh, quantum field theoretic fluctuations of, of fundamental objects of string theory, strings, brains, uh, and their bound states. Okay, here I've shown you the first example where every, all the numerical factors, everything matched, but um, these, um, uh, these kind of efforts started with, with Sen and Strom and Javafa, and then there's a huge industry following them. Um, so you, you list all these states, and then you can count how many states there are. You can make an estimate for large charges, and you find that indeed um, the logarithm of the number of microstates is equal to the thermodynamic entropy. All right, so this is the basic picture we'll keep in mind. So now let's look at um, both sides of the picture um, in a bit of detail. So this will be called macroscopic or thermodynamic or gravitational. And this one I'll call microscopic or weakly coupled um, at various times in the talk. All right. So uh, first let's look at the gravitational picture. Um, so one question one could ask is if this kind of a Boltzmann e equation is true, um, then the left-hand side is really, um, so, so suppose there's a Boltzmann equation which is true in all its detail, then the left-hand side is a logarithm of an integer, and it's just some count of some number of states here. Okay, so there's some, this, these two pictures have the same boundary conditions, and there might be some asymptotic um, values of various fields that one fixes, but this integer is just an integer. While on this side, um, you're talking about a black hole solution, which is some uh, solution of um, some set of partial differential equations, which typically are sensitive to the boundary conditions. 
So if you have an integer, then if you change the boundary conditions, then it shouldn't change too much. It shouldn't change at all, um, except discreetly. Whereas here, typically there'll be continuous changes. So how is this even possible? And the attraction mechanism was an answer to uh, this question, among others. Um, and the fact is that the near horizon field configuration is completely fixed by the black hole charges. So if you write the supersymmetric black hole, so supersymmetric equations for this black hole, um, these turn out to be first order equations, which have a certain fixed point in the sense of PDEs. Um, and therefore, the the value, the fixed point is at the, which is at the horizon, the values at the fixed point uh, doesn't depend, don't depend on the asymptotic moduli. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the attractor mechanism. So values of all the fields. So all the, the shapes and sizes of all the fields, the graviton, vector fields, uh, scalar fields, everything gets fixed. Okay. Um, and that means that the black hole entropy also gets fixed completely by the charges. Now, if you look at this in detail, you'll find that the metric always takes the form ADS2 times S2 in this near horizon region. This is in four dimensions. Otherwise, there's always an ADS2 factor times some compact factor. The electric and magnetic field strengths are constant, and the scalar fields are constant okay, at, the, at, the, at this attractor point. And this, uh, this kind of uh, extremal geometry is intrinsically tied to the attractor me mechanism. Okay? So if you look at either the original derivation um, or any of the following derivations, you'll find that extremality is very important to the story. Um, the original derivation kind of took a mixture of extremality and supersymmetry, but you could do one or the other. So here, there was a very nice set of papers by Sen, who said, let's not worry about uh, supersymmetry and only demand extremality. And again, you get this kind of, at least at the classical level, semi-classical level, you get uh, the same fixed point behavior. Or you could take the other route and say, I only demand supersymmetry. Yeah. But even then, what happens is near the horizon of the black hole, you have enhanced supersymmetry. So there's the whole um, geometry. So the, the theory has eight supercharges. So asymptotically, there's a flat space, which is eight supercharges. In the middle, there's you know, one half BPS, so four supercharges. And near the horizon, again, there's eight superchargers. And the only configuration that supports that is ADS2 times S2. Okay. So in any way of looking at it, um, in all derivations so far, these black holes are extremal. It's zero temperature and extreme. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now let's look at the microscopic picture. Um, now you ask, what are we really counting? And in all these examples where um, there have been successes, what you really count is not really the number of microstates, but a supersymmetric index. Okay, so just, um, I'll, I'll run through this quickly. There's an expert audience, um, but it's good to go through the basics. So you imagine some complex supercharge, which obeys this super algebra. Q, Q bar is a Hamiltonian. That means that any state with uh, the Hamiltonian greater than zero always comes in boson fermion pairs. Um, while Hamiltonian equal to zero um, could either come as a pair or as a singlet. Um, and now you write this Witten index, um, which is like a partition function, trace it to the minus beta h, but you also stick in a minus one to the fermion number. Um, and because of the pairing, you see that none of the h greater than zero states contribute. So this index is independent of beta, um, and it reduces to the difference of the number of bosons and fermions of zero energy. Yeah. Um, and then you see that if you change the Hamiltonian in a supersymmetric way, which means you always preserve this, this kind of a super algebra, even though the actual forms of the supercharges and Hamiltonian changes, um, the, the spectrum can shift, but the only shifts possible are um, the, the levels of the uh, paired states go up or down. And therefore, the number of zero energy states, um, bosonic minus fermionic states is invariant. Okay, so that's one of the most important properties of the index, um, that if you change the Hamiltonian, the index doesn't change. So now we want to apply this to our situation. Um, so this is a four dimensional N equal to two super, uh, super gravity, eight supercharges. Um, so I should have said, uh, this is the basic index which applies to any supersymmetric quantum mechanics. 
And this can be refined in many ways um, by putting uh, operators here which commute with supersymmetry. Or if there are fermion zero modes, then uh, it's not just trace minus one of the F, but you also have to absorb some fermion zero modes. Okay. All of uh, so the, the form of the indices in different situations is different, but the Witten index really uh, shows the, the basic behavior in, in, in all the cases. Okay. So here for n equal to two supergravity or uh, higher n high extended supergravity, the um, the appropriate uh, index is called the helicity supertrace. Um, but essentially, the algebra that we have to focus on is like this: q q bar is e minus the absolute value of z, where z is the central charge of the theory. And you can think of that as the energy or the mass of the BPS state of a given charge. Okay. So now, if you write the, an index which is slightly different from what I showed you, it's trace minus one to the f e to the minus beta e, which is what you would naturally do from infinity. You see that the split says the old Witten index times e to the minus beta m BPS. And if you're in a sector of a fixed charge, that's just a constant factor. So that's the microscopic index that you calculate um, times e to the minus beta m BPS. Okay. You can rework this in other ensembles. You can, if you take a canonical ensemble, you can make the whole thing into an index. All right. So that's the index you want to calculate in the microscopic theory. Um, and now, because it's protected, the same index should, uh, should be written in the macroscopic variables, in the gravitational variables. Now, of course, in the gravitational variables, there is no notion of trace. There's no notion of a good Hilbert space, but there is still a formal notion of a functional integral, a Euclidean path integral. And we can try to make sense of it uh, in, uh, at small g Newton using saddle point approximations. Okay, and the index is um, the, so it's the, it's the path integral over all the fields of supergravity. Um, and the minus one to the F just says, that all the fields should be um, periodic. They should have supersymmetric boundary conditions, including the fermions. Right? And the question, um, so given that the index here in this microscopic picture um, is uh, to a very good approximation equal to e to the entropy over here, the question is you would, you would expect that the supersymmetric black hole would be a saddle point of this integral. And, and the more general question is, what are the saddle points? Right? Um, and is the supersymmetric black hole a saddle point? OK, so any questions so far? OK. Now, the fact is that there is a tension between the attractor black hole and the path integral. So what is the tension? So generally speaking, when we say that a black hole um, contributes to a functional integral in the Euclidean theory, we mean something like this. So think of finite temperature black holes. If you fix some temperature, which is the size of the Euclidean circle, and you ask what's the geometry that fills it. And if you have a black hole geometry, then typically there's a cigar-like topology. Um, with, a, with an S2 uh, fiber over it. And this sphere at the tip of the cigar is the horizon. Okay, in the Euclidean theory, there's nothing else. Um, however, the attractor black holes are um, extremal. The, the, the two horizons, the inner and outer horizon, um, are on top of each other. So beta goes to infinity. So the size of the Euclidean circle is, is infinite. And that's why the tube also goes all the way into infinity. Uh, so into the interior, uh, it extends infinitely. All right? So it's an infinite throat in the interior. And one way to say it is that that gives rise to an infinite action, even after subtracting the background um, of, 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 uh, of your theory. For example, flat space. OK? And therefore, it doesn't contribute. Th this statement can be understood in many different ways. Um, one way is, is this uh, by Hawking, Horowitz, and Ross, where you can say, let's try to just put a finite beta and ask what happens. And then you get that there's a cusp in the geometry. Um, and then you sort of work it through. And you again, you find that the black hole actually doesn't contribute um, to the uh, functional integral. Okay, there are many ways of understanding it. Basically, this, these uh, objects are sort of rigid or singular in some, in some sense. 
Uh, okay, so before I come to the resolution, I should say that um, just keeping aside this tension, uh, the, the whole slide is a parenthetical slide, So, but let me just make these comments. Um, keeping aside this tension, there is a way to work uh, with this index on the microscopic side and the entropy on the black hole side, um, which is as follows. One um, starts by assuming that there is a um, some kind of a Hilbert space structure, which factorizes into some black hole Hilbert space, which about we know nothing about, times the outside Hilbert space, which is just some fluctuations of graviton. So that's controllable. This is due to Sen in 2009. I thought I'd put a reference. Um, and the outside part can be quantized explicitly. Okay, these are just graviton fluctuations or field fluctuations. Ah, uh, sorry, that, that's the that's the reference. This reference is where it shows this. Um, and the, um, then you assume so you assume some kind of a factorization, and when you look at the index and you say the index has contributions from here times contribution from here, um, and the black hole itself, then you change that putative Hilbert space into a functional integral, uh, and then you treat the functional integral using um, whatever method you have with ADS2 boundary conditions. Okay, and then there's a whole set of arguments which says why the index for the ADS2 functional integral equals the entropy of the black hole. Okay, so I, I'm not going to uh, repeat this here unless there are specific questions, uh, but that's that's sort of the way to get around this. Sorry, was just, there a question? Just one small comment. Yes, please. You can film this factorization, but the factorization has been much better justified recently by showing that the, the obstruction to the factorization has to do with the Schwarzian mode. And it uh, has a gap. Okay, thank you. So, so I should have said that, but um, so in fact, let me be a little more precise. Uh, so this was back. Uh, thank you, Edward. Uh, this was back in two thousand ten. Um, then, indeed, uh, uh, as you just said, uh, it was shown that there's an obstruction, um, and then uh, it was also shown that for supersymmetric black holes, um, you can get around this obstruction. So this was a paper that I wrote with um, um, Iliesu and Turiachi, where um, we showed that this uh, the Schwarzian mode is essentially mapped to some kind of zero modes um, on on the ADS two functional integral, and you have to then rework. You can rework this argument of what happens to the index and entropy um, using this uh, on this extra factor of the Schwarzian mode, and the uh, conclusions that the black hole in uh, th this index is equal to the black hole entropy um, remains. Okay, so thank you. So it's it's more subtle, but you can also work that out. Yeah, is that all right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so that's for one black hole. And then uh, if you have many black holes, then um, you can also use sort of a similar picture to, to do this. Uh, I'm not doing complete justi justice to this, but roughly you think of it as a Hilbert space where each black hole is a point particle to zeroth approximation. Um, and then you work out of the quantum mechanics of this system and then quantizes each one of them and their interactions properly. So two of these authors are in the audience and it's a very beautiful set of works um, where um, you can sort of use these ideas to get a lot of mileage, okay? Um, so that ends my parenthesis. Uh, however, I would still like to not take this mixed Hilbert space path integral formalism, but just ask if, um, you know, try to follow Gibbons and Hawking and ask if there's a uniform functional integral formalism in which everything fits. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to say this. So any other comments about this? Okay, very good. Uh, then, so let me come to the nature of the resolution. Um, so th this kind of uh, a tension between, um, um, so the tension between extremal black holes and, and the uh, path integral for the index actually appears in, in uh, not just for the attractor mechanism, for but for any kind of supersymmetric black hole in string theory. And in the context of ADS5 black holes um, and the superconformal index of n equal to four super young males, um, uh, in this paper with Alejandro Cabo, we said, Davide Cassani and Davide Mar uh, Dario Martelli, uh, we resolved this um, in, in this tension. And the idea is that um, there's a 
one fam one parameter family of deformations of the supersymmetric black hole, uh, which break extremality but preserve supersymmetry. And um, our idea was that the index should be defined as uh, uh, being calculated on this one parameter family and then taking a t goes to zero limit to get back the original black hole. That's how we should define the contribution of the supersymmetric black hole. Um, and the, the point about these black holes, so if you, if you have, haven't followed this, the statement uh, might be surprising because usually we, we're used to think of these black holes, thinking of these black holes as some kind of uh, unique solutions given uh, enough parameters. Um, and indeed that's true in the Lorentzian theories, um, these uh, deformations that I'm talking about are causally ill behaved. Typically they have uh, close time lag curves. However, in the Euclidean theory, um, you can make sense of them um, as long as you're willing to um, uh, live with a complex deformation. So what it means is that the idea is that you want to um, write the dual to the index as a minus one to the f, but minus one to the f can equivalently be written as um, as a Wilson line for any R symmetry gauge field to be equal to pi i. Okay, that's where the complex nature comes in, and this R symmetry gauge field could be either angular momentum or an R symmetry u one gauge field, whatever you have in the theory, um, and then this solution has flux for this gauge field. And at the tip, this Wilson line vanishes so that actually the spinners um, are uh, smooth. Okay, so that also resolves this, this um, confusion of how can you have a, a cigar type topology, uh, which usually, which has anti-periodic spin structures only. Okay, so all of these points are resolved um, by, by these kind of deformations. Um, and the geometry is perfectly smooth. So you have to take some real slides to, to draw this picture. And in the limit t goes to zero, you get back this ADS2 times S3 black hole. Okay. Um, and finally, you can calculate the action, on-shell action of this black hole. That's a finite object after subtracting the background. Um, and you can check that that's indeed equal to the free energy. Um, sorry, you can calculate the finite action of this solution, and that's equal to the free energy of the extremal black hole in the sense of Gibbons and Hawking. So there's there are all these, there's a lot of chemical potentials and uh, the free energy in the grand canonical ensemble with the entropy being the entropy of the black hole, okay? So this was uh, sort of laid out in this ADS-5 context. And then this was extended to various ADS spaces um, in, in various papers. And then in this nice paper, um, the same idea was used uh, for supersymmetric black holes in flat space, right? Then minimal ungauged supergravity. So this is just the simplest supergravity theory, um, <clears throat> which is of the type that we want to study today. Okay, so we want to take this as a starting point and then generalize um, to more general um, uh, supergravity. So, but any questions about this? Okay, uh, <clears throat> so then today what I want to discuss is this. So n equal to two supergravity coupled to um, vector multiplets, an arbitrary number of vector multiplets. And what we find are saddle points of this index. So these are cigar-like configurations, exactly of the type that I showed. Um, and these solutions are actually uh, well known in the literature. They go by the name of Israel Wilson Perget solutions. Um, I'll discuss this in more detail. And just briefly, the points about this uh, solution to note is that uh, so firstly, they're capped, they're cigar-like, they're supersymmetric, they admit killing spinners. They have the same charges as that of the black hole, and there are dipole fields um, for um, some of the electromagnetic charges, and there's a rotation. Okay, so the supersymmetric black hole um, in four-dimensionally asymptotic gauge fields doesn't rotate, but these solutions necessarily ro rotate. Okay, that's the, the rotation is tied uh, to the temperature, that's like the deformation. Okay, again, these are complex. Um, now, surprisingly, so these are not, so again, I emphasize these are not extremal, but surprisingly, there is an attractor mechanism uh, associated with it. So this is the nice part, um, which is that, so these, the, the, these black holes rotate. So at the horizon, um, the rotation uh, defines for you a north and a south pole. Um, and the scalar field value at the horizon now is no longer fixed. But at the poles, the scalar field, uh, sorry, 
what I mean by fixed is not fixed by the charges completely, but at the poles, um, they are fixed by the charges. Um, and the dipole charges of the solution, which are new parameters of the solutions, are also fixed um, in terms of the black hole charges. And the grand canonical free energy with respect to the temperature and the um, angular, sorry, energy and angular momentum uh, is also fixed in the sense that it's the it's the grand canonical dual of the extreme of the energy. So all these, so the the attractor mechanism, the new attractor mechanism says that there are these different quantities which get fixed completely in terms of the charges. Okay, so I want to explain this in the rest of the talk. All right. Um, any any questions? So that's my introduction. Any questions uh, about what I want to do? Okay, very well. Um, <clears throat> then let me continue. So first, let me sketch um, this mechanism in the simplest context, namely pure supergravity. So pure supergravity means there is a, a graviton, gravitino, and one gauge field, a gravity photon. And the bosonic action is just Einstein-Maxwell theory. And so first, let's look at the extreme of black hole. This is well known. So this is spherically symmetric. So there is one um, mm, harmonic function, source function. So this is just an electric field sitting at the origin, um, which controls the whole geometry, whole, whole field configuration. So we call this V. Um, so the metric is just given by this simple ansatz. And the electric field is also controlled by V. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the area of the black hole is very easy to calculate. In fact, you can almost eyeball it. You can ask what happens at x goes to zero. And you see that, uh, so the absolute value of x is, is, let's call it r, the radial coordinate. So there's a one over r square, which cancels with the r square. So the area of the, the, the sphere here is just q square times pi. Okay. Very good. Um, this black hole, this I think is extremely familiar to everybody. And this black hole obeys uh, the supersymmetric condition that m equals q, and it admits scaling spinners. And I want to make this point that um, in this simple situation, all these considerations are very simple to understand. So just recall that, just go one step back. And before imposing supersymmetry, just uh, look at the sort of regularity of the Lorentzian solutions, and you'll find that m square is greater than or equal to q square plus j square. And now on top of this, if you impose the supersymmetry m equals q, right, then uh, you just get j equal to zero. And that's this is why you get the slogan that supersymmetric black holes in four dimensions don't rotate. Right? Um, and now if you look at the Euclidean continuation, it's also clear from here that the temperature, well, the, the time circle um, has infinite periodicity. Um, or as I said, uh, this takes a little more work, but you can check that if you impose a, if you sort of demand the finite beta, then you, know, you get some uh, singularity. Okay. okay, so I think this, all of these points are fairly familiar. Um, but now I want to um, go to the supergravity and ask, um, and only impose what happens, sorry, only impose the BPS condition. Okay, I just want to ask what happens, what is the class of supersymmetric solutions? Okay, so this question was asked by uh, asked and answered by Todd, who said that the most general um, metric that that admits killing spinners is of this form. Okay, uh, Todd had actually he was looking at the Lorentzian theory. Here I've already weak rotated it, but in, in your mind you can put a minus one here. Um, and this solution uh, actually goes back a long way to Perges and uh, Israel Wilson. And then you will um, here study the, the Euclidean theory. Um, and now instead of one harmonic function, you have two harmonic functions, V and V tilde. And uh, there is this one form omega E, which shows that there is angular momentum. Okay? And the angular momentum, the rotation, is uh, also completely specified by these harmonic functions V and V tilde. Right? So this is just sort of abstract algebraic analysis. Um, so the harmonicity comes when you, so you have to couple this 
to gauge fields. And then when you impose the gauge fields equation motion, you get that V is V and V till are harmonic. And you see that um, there is an electric field as before, um, but now there's also a magnetic field here, um, which I'll call a dipole for a, uh, for a reason you know, we'll see in a second. Uh, but uh, first notice that if you put V equal to V tilde, you get back the old extremal solution because the rotation is also zero. And this magnetic field also becomes zero. All right. right. So now let's um, take this answer where V and V tilde are of the same uh, form as before. They're harmonic sources, but at different points. Okay, I call this the North Pole XN and South Pole XS. Um, and this, you can check that this metric then um, continues to obey the supersymmetric solution m equals condition m equals q that means killing spinners and from here now you can see why I call this a dipole so think of um, the original black hole as a double pole sitting at the origin what I've done is to make it into two single poles so far away there is still the same electric field um, but because now these two are at different points there's also a magnetic uh, field but far from the black hole, this, this decays much faster. It far decays at the rate of a dipole. Right. Um, this solution does not have a good Lorentzian continuation, exactly as in the ADS-5 case. Um, but it does have a well-defined Euclidean continuation. Okay, So if you just take this metric and plot it, you'll get a Euclidean black hole with a, um, a cigar. Um, however, that's still not the end of the story because you'll find that um, without doing anything else, there is a uh, there's a Dirac string singularity connecting the North Pole and the South Pole. So this omega um, you see um, has a, a non-zero curl even very close to this uh, Dirac string. Okay, but of course that's a coordinate artifact, and you want to get rid of that by by changing some by making a coordinate transformation on T, and you can do that. You can uh, just get rid of this. This singularity is just a coordinate singularity, but when you do that, then you have to shift t uh, at exact with exactly the right periodicity in order to be consistent with the angular periodicity. Okay, that's just a way of ensuring smoothness in these kind of coordinates. Right? And what you find uh, when you do that, sorry, that argument I should have referred uh, is a, so is, is is was first given by Hartle and Hawking, um, and when you do that to this. Uh, to this geometry, you get um, that the angular velocity of the black hole, um, that's um, that's equal to two pi over beta the, uh, in the Euclidean theorem. Okay, So there is an angular momentum. It has a slightly more complicated form that depends on um, the charge and the temperature. But the angular velocity has this very simple form. OK. Uh, and now you see that this angular velocity is exactly what you need for the index. Sorry, Samir, can I ask a question? Uh, does does uh, that supersymmetry require the coefficient of the poles at the north and south pole to be equal? OK, that's a great question. I'm going to answer this. Uh, the answer is, uh, yeah, so supersymmetry actually requires um, that these two are equal. I'm going to do this exactly in that language uh, in, in, in a moment. Uh, the If you just do it in the Euclidean theory, uh, you find, so let me more precise. Um, if you assume that there's a complex pair so there's a complex pair of supercharges, right? Uh, in the Lorentzian theory, the complex conjugate, that's what tells you that the, the two things are equal. You, you'll see a, a slightly more um, emphatic version of this in the following. Um, you could also have asked for one real supercharge and that we haven't analyzed. Yeah. Um, then you might get a genuinely complex solution. Um, there is, we also have a statement about that. I'll, I'll try to say something about this. That was Boris, I suppose, uh, about this uh, a few slides from now. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, now, if you, yeah, I was saying the point I wanted to make was that this omega, beta omega is equal to pi, is exactly what you need for the index. Because remember, the index was uh, minus one to the f, which is e to the two pi ij times uh, e to the minus beta times Hamiltonian. So that's perfectly consistent. So what this is saying is that the smooth solution exists um, as a saddle point of the index. Okay, it's not you know, a revolution because this had killing spinners. Um, so it's it's natural that it it um, contributes to the index, but it's nice to see everything work out properly. Okay, any other questions?
very good um <clears throat> so now uh, good now you see uh I, so i described this solution in some language which may be unfamiliar but in fact if you just use this coordinate transformation between the uh, flat base space to what are called oblate spherical coordinates then you just find the euclidean kernel metric okay, which should be much more familiar um, and you see, here you see the angular momentum uh, the a parameter uh, is a function of the charge and beta. Uh, and again, I just write down the properties. The key properties are that m equals q, the temperature is 1 over beta, and the angular velocity is 2 pi over beta. You can also read that off completely from this, uh, this metric. Okay. Now, in either one of the coordinates, you can calculate the onshell action, and you find that the onshell action has this very nice form. It's minus beta q plus pi q square. Minus beta q is just mbps, and pi q square is just the extreme of entropy. All right? And then you can find, uh, so note that the area over four of the black hole is not equal to pi q square. That's also some complicated function of q and beta. Um, and if you say that the on-shell action is equal to beta times the free energy, you find that it's actually in the grand canonical ensemble with respect to all three, m, with respect to all both m and j and an area. So this, so all of these three, Things have um, um, sort of um, non-simple forms, but the final on-shell action has a very simple form in terms of the extremal entropy. Okay, I, I hope I said that clearly. It's, it's a fairly simple point. I'm saying that at the deformation, the area of the black hole is not equal to the extremal entropy, but the on-shell action is the right um, is the right quantity to consider. And after subtracting this constant BPS mass, the on-shell on action is actually independent of beta. That, that's how I should have said it. All right, so that was the, the basic uh, pure supergravity. Um, and now I want to go to the n equal to two supergravity um, coupled to an arbitrary number of vector. So can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. please. Uh, I mean, regarding the horizon, uh, yeah. So we have uh, North Pole and South Pole, and and and, uh, and those are uh, uh, on the single horizon, right? They're at the horizon, yeah. So there's a there's a sphere at the tip, which I call the horizon, and that sphere has it's it's. I mean, it's not spherically symmetric anymore. There's a North and South Pole. So horizon uh, horizon is somehow deformed. Uh, in in a in a certain sense, yeah, yeah, it's rotating. Ah, uh, okay, okay, right. So that's that's what defines the north and south pole. Earlier we just had a sphere in the extremal case. Now it's rotating. So, but the north and south pole are still special points. Okay. All right. So n equal to supergravity. Let me just. Remind you of the key uh, ideas, key concepts, the language. So I'm going to use the conformal supergravity formalism. So there's a graviton or a while multiplet plus uh, NV plus one vector multiplets. Each vector multiplet has a vector field, a complex scalar, and gauge uni. And under each vector field, there can be electric and magnetic charges. And the magnetic and electric charges uh, form a two NV plus two dimensional vector. Um, and the classical supergravity has um, an sp2 and v plus 2 uh, symmetry which rotates these charges. This is the electric magnetic duality of the low energy supergravity. Okay. And this formalism is nice because it, it maintains this, super symmet this symmetry uh, manifestly. Um, and the theory, in order to get an action, you must specify a prepotential which is a homogeneous degree two function. Um, so for example, if you have NV equals three, like in the STU model, then F of X is just X1, X2, X3 divided by X0. Okay, I'm just jogging your memory. Um, and the first derivatives of F with respect to the X are called Fi. And Xi and Fi also form a vector under this symplectic group called the period vector, omega. 
And the true derivative action is completely determined by f of x. Um, now, in this conformal supergravity formalism, there is the, the local gauge invariance is the Poincaré um, supersymmetries, as well as um, the conformal symmetry. So the super conformal symmetry is gauged. Um, and if you want to go to Poincaré uh, supergravity, you have to uh, gauge fix the, the scale, the scaling symmetry. Um, actually, in, uh, in these papers and subsequent papers of Cardoso, Dewitt, Mohopt, and Capelli, um, there's very nice, all the equations, relevant equations can be written in gauge invariant variables. That's the one I like the best, um, but they take a little more space and, and in order to um, sort of make it, make the equation slightly cleaner, um, I, I put a gauge condition. You don't, have, you don't have to put this until the very end, but it helps to, uh, for, uh, to just sort of yeah, present some equations. So I'm gonna put this gauge condition immediately to, for this, combination of scalars, which is actually called um, the Kähler potential, uh, we, we fix that to a certain scale, the M-Planck square, which I'm going to set to one. Okay. That gives you the Poincaré supergravity. Um, and I'll stick, so all, a lot of these formulas, if you're confused about something, it could be because I've already set M-Planck square equal to one. If you're not confused, then don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so one of the important functions here is called the central charge function which is a function of the charges and um, the, the scalars or the period vector, okay? And what it is, is just the, it's the symplectic inner product. So there's a symplectic um, symmetry and there's the natural symplectic inner product uh, defined um, in this theory. There's like a Dirac uh, bracket, Dirac Swansigal bracket between the charges and the um, uh, period vector, okay? the anti-symmetric uh, product. Sorry, I, uh, symplectic product. I, I don't know why I said inner product. Symplectic product. Um, and this Z is called the central charge because it is the central charge. So for example, if you go to infinity, um, then uh, measure the ADM mass and, and all the charges, then you find that indeed M is greater than or equal to the absolute value of Z. Right? Okay, so this plays an important role. Um, so here you can now ask, what is the most general supersymmetric solution? Okay, this is the analog of the question of Todd. There's lots of references uh, between Todd and here. Uh, so the important papers by Kalosh, by many people, but these are the ones I followed um, um, in this n equal to formalism. And the answer is that the most general supersymmetric solution is specified by a choice by a symplectic vector of harmonic functions. All right, so these are called H tilde and H. Um, and the scalar fields, the period vector, is completely determined by this um, uh, equation, vector equation, which are called the generalized stabilization equations. Um, it, it looks, if you are not used to it, it looks a little bit, uh, you have to unpack it. The best way to unpack it is to go to coordinates. You can, um, from X and F, you can multiply that by z bar. It's a highly nonlinear normalization factor, but um, you get these fields y and g. And in terms of these y and g fields, uh, these equations uh, look very simple. It's just that the imaginary part of y is h tilde, the imaginary part of g is h. Remember that h and h tilde are space time dependent functions. And these equations are, are completely nonlinear because they involve the scalars and the central charge, which is a function of the scalars and of the harmonic function, okay? But it's nevertheless, it's some standalone set of equations, very beautiful set of equations. Uh, and the main point is that they're completely algebraic. Okay. Um, those are the scalars um, and the metric and gauge fields are also completely determined, okay? The metric has this uh, Todd form, uh, the Israel wilson Perchez form. Um, where this blackening factor uh, is given by z times z bar as a function of h and omega. And the curl of uh, omega, the small omega, the, the spin, is again given by the symplectic product between h and dh. Okay. Good, so that's the answer uh, at the algebraic level. Okay, this is in fact true, even for the Lorentzian theory. 
Um, and so therefore, if you want a solution, you just have to pick. So, you know, if you want more, if you want a garden of solutions, you just have to pick different types of harmonic functions. All right. So in fact, all the supersymmetric solutions that we know, um, this comes from this ansatz. Um, yes, yeah, both simple and complex solutions. So the, for example, the extremal black hole corresponds to when this vector of harmonic functions are all sourced. So there's some constant here, constant vector, plus they're all sourced at the origin. Okay, they all have different charges, but they're all sitting at the origin. That's spherically symmetric by construction. And um, you see that as r, which is the, the distance from the origin goes to zero, um, these fields y and g uh, go, uh, go to a constant divided by r. I should have said something which I forgot, which was here in the central charge, you see that um, the under the scaling of the charges, the central charge scales with weight one, okay? And therefore, if the charge is a harmonic function, and it looks like gamma over r, then the central charge just goes as one over r times gamma, uh, z of gamma. Okay. Uh, that's what uh, I said here. And because the normalization is that this is what happens. Um, and then you can plug this into the generalized stabilization equations, and you get uh, equations for these constant values of scalars. This is probably much more familiar to almost all of you in the audience, I'm almost certain. These are the stabilization equations or the attractor equations okay? uh, for the constant values of the scalars at the horizon in terms of the charges. All right. um, and the solution I'm going to call um, omega star. Okay, So y star or omega star is the solution of this uh, as a function of the charges alone. So now notice that the scalar fields have now become a function of the charges here. Okay. So star denotes that. It's the, it's the, it's the solution function. Uh, and now, therefore, I can define something called an attractor central charge, which is just a, a function of the charges only, which is the central charge uh, of the charges and omega star. Okay, It's just the central charge at the horizon. All right. So that's the, mo that's the most important function which is going to play a role in the solutions. Um, and now you see that because H is all, uh, everybody's sitting at the origin, there is no uh, spin. Um, and this blackening factor is just given by ZZ bar divided by R square. And again, you can read off that the area goes as uh, ZZ bar, uh, Z star, Z star bar, I mean. And therefore the extremal entropy is just pi times that, okay? Here I've written another formula which is useful um, uh, for the, the extremal entropy in terms of the attractor scalars. You can play, uh, there are many, there are at least three nice formulas Okay, so this was kind of a review of the old attractor equation, uh, attractor mechanism. Now let's go back to the uh, most general. Uh, so let's go, go back to the general supersymmetric solutions. Now I want to show you um, the new attractors. Okay, so before that, any any questions about the old attractor? Okay. So um, this is a uh, work with Jan and Luca and, and Joaquin. Uh, hopefully this should appear soon. So here's the answer. So we take now um, this kind of a rotating attractor. So this, uh, this, in, this in this Todd form or uh, Israel Wilson form. Um, and now you have to ask what is H? So where earlier all the harmonic functions were sitting at the origin, now we split it into the north and south poles, such that the total charge is equal to gamma. Yeah. Um, and now there are new parameters, which is the difference in, in charges and also the distance. Okay. Now, uh, I'll come to the question that Boris asked, but before that, um, just like in the pure supergravity, in this case, you can also ask, you can first demand that the solution, the Euclidean solution is smooth. Okay. So you can use the same type of technology I said, that there is no Dirac string. And you find that there is, a, there is one condition between um, these parameters and the temperature at infinity. And you can think of this as fixing the distance in terms of the, um, um, the temperature, the asymptotic values of the scalars, and all the charges, including the dipole charges. Okay, so at least one of the parameters you got rid of, 
by this smoothness condition. Right. So that leads to, so the notice that the asymptotic values of the scalar is playing a role here. Right. Now you know, now you notice that um, um, near the North Pole, the blackening factor has the same behavior, Z, Z bar. Z bar really means it's Z of omega bar. That's what I should have said. Divided by rho square, where rho is the distance to the North Pole. So let's say you're close to the North Pole. Right. So this seems uh, to pose a puzzle. How come you can, you know, I, I said that by, by changing, by making them, by, by splitting this, this harmonic function, you can um, make it non-extremal, but e to minus two, two u still has, uh, has this form. And the only way to avoid it is by complexifying the solution. Okay, so you demand that Z is zero, but Z bar is not zero. Okay, so this is a complex solution. And that gives you a single pole at the North Pole. And you get, get uh, and you can have, you have the opposite phenomenon at the South Pole. So you have this cigar um, times this circle, uh, sphere. All right. Now you ask what happens to the stabilization equations? Okay, so this is the general form of the stabilization equations. Right, that I wrote down. But now notice that Z, uh, Z at the North Pole is zero. So at the North Pole, you only have this term left. Okay, so you get half of the, of the stabilization equation because gamma at the North Pole becomes gamma N. And at the South Pole, you get the other half of, this, of, the, same, of the stabilization equation. Okay, but now everything is complexified. And now here is, um, so I, I sort of, uh, I said something uh, here, which is, uh, I summarized a few things in, in this split. Um, a priori, you could have split gamma n. So notice what, I, what, have I, what I've done. I've, I said that half the magnetic charges, the original electric charge and magnetic charges go up and down. Um, and then the new, there can be complexified charges, which are equal and opposite. Okay. A priori, I could have had something else. I could also have had P plus some uh, K and P minus K, which also uh, then is a much more general situation. Okay. Now, there are two ways to, to solve this problem. One is, as I said, if you go back to the original um, Lorentzian um, generalized, um, Lorentzian most general solution, and there's a pair of complex um, Keeling spinners, then you find that H and H, then you naturally find this kind of a complex conjugate split. I can, Boris, I can tell you more about this uh, later, but you can imagine how that happens. That if if in the Lorentzian theory, everything is complex conjugate, then the, the charge co configuration is also complex conjugate, okay? Um, but you could also ask what happens if um, I don't insist and I just directly go to the Euclidean theory, and try for a more general uh, solution of charges. It turns out that um, that's also solvable, but that's a little bit more detailed. Um, and it relies on an assumption that the solution to these attractor equations is unique. It's because of what I'm gonna show you is a solution to the dipole charges. Um, and I'll show you one solution. And if there's a unique solution, that's the only one. Okay, so that's, that's my understanding of the answer to your question. Okay, I'm happy to discuss that more. But now let's look at it uh, in a little more detail. So the North Pole equation um, is complex. So there's there's a complex y, um, and it's equal to half times p plus i n, and the g is equal to q plus i m times half. And these are the dipole charges, so the new dipole charges, which should be determined. These are parameters of the solution, meaning these are dynamical parameters of the solution. They're not fixed at infinity. Um, but now you can look at the real and imaginary parts of this, these equations, and you find that the real part of this equation is just um, is p, and, and this equation is q. But this is precisely the old stabilization equation. This is exactly the attractor equations with the same charges as before. Okay. So what this is saying is that the scalars take their, the y scalars take their extremal value at the North Pole, the old extremal value at the North Pole, the attractor value, and the y bar scalar takes the extremal value at the South Pole. And then when these things move through the sphere, uh, becoming more complicated, All right? Um, now, what about the dipole charges? The dipole charges are the imaginary parts of these equations, um, but that's precisely the real part of the attractor scalars. But remember here that 
these solutions are a complete set of solutions for the attractors, for the complex YNs. And therefore, these solutions actually determine the real parts as well. Um, and uh, therefore, they also determine the dipole charges. Okay. In the old attractor story, the real part of the uh, scalars were um, often interpreted uh, as, as being the chemical potential for gauge fields um, or, or in, some, in some interpretations. But here they have this interpretation of the dipole charges. Okay. And the extremal entropy, uh, you can use this formula for the scalars. And if you just plug it in, if you just use these attractor equations here and plug it into this um, formula, you find that the extremal entropy has this very elegant form. It's just the inner product between the, the uh, charge at the North Pole and that at the South Pole. Okay. Very good. Uh, this is the last slide. Um, so all this, so this was the new attractor mechanism. And now, uh, so far I haven't, so this was just an observation about the extremal entropy, not about the area of the black hole. This is just the, um, the old extremal entropy formula. Okay, this has nothing so far, it has nothing to do with this new attractor mechanism. And in fact, it doesn't as an area, um, but we should measure the onshell action. Okay, so as, as in the pure supergravity case, the area and the angular momentum are complicated functions of the temperature and asymptotic moduli. Yeah. But the value of the onshell action is very simple. It's equal to, um, basically, uh, you have some kind of a total derivative term, and there's one term at infinity, which is equal to this, beta times absolute value of z at infinity, and the, another term which is at the tip, which is exactly uh, pi i times the inner product between the gamma and gamma s. And from what we said, that's just beta times the BPS energy plus the extremal black hole entropy. Okay, so the on-shell energy, on-shell action knows uh, about the extremal entropy. Okay? Of course, in terms of the area and the angular momentum, um, this on-shell action is the grand canonical free energy uh, for, uh, for the variables of energy and rotation. Okay, and this area, as I said, is a complicated. So this these complicated functions um, so assemble into this nice on-shell energy, and the value of the on-shell energy gives you exactly the um, uh, index, the, the value of the index. Okay, so this is, I'll just end with some uh, comments. So what we showed is that um, there are these rotating Euclidean black holes, which can provide consistent saddle points to the index for um, four-dimensional flat space. Um, you know, th this could contribute to the question of which saddles contribute to the path integral in general. Okay, these are complex. It's 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 fairly compelling that these these are the right saddle points um, to the gibbon hawking path integral for the index. Um, then you can ask, well, once I fit the black hole into into the path integral, this opens up the whole story. What what are the other saddles? So here, by 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 this, I meant this answer also might help to um, answer this other question about, about path integrals in general. But here I'm asking, what about other saddles to this particular path integral that I just showed you, including complex ones? So what about multi-center black holes? So there's some work in progress with the same people. Uh, what about wall crossing? Um, and this, there's a whole rich phenomenon, which um, in the past has been answered, but again, so using this mix of Hilbert space, going back to like for multi-center black holes, Deneff has this very beautiful story, and then Deneff and more. Um, but it always uses this mix of Hilbert space and, and path integral methods. And the hope is to put everything into one consistent story. And uh, first, the 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 big, I mean, where I, where we're trying to go with all this is is um, can we localize this integral? Um, and there sort of there are um, sort of hints that something like that could happen. And could we sort of derive these microscopic string theory formulas um, directly in asymptotic flat space? Okay, so there's lots more to talk about this, but I will, I'm out of time um, exactly, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>